Okay, so we've learned some new things about chemical reactions and a way that we can draw a diagram that looks kind of like a staircase, either like going up or coming down, to show how much energy is in chemicals before and after a reaction. And I think generally when we ask questions about these, it's we give you a diagram and ask you questions about it, but we can ask you to draw one also, and that's what these problems are about. So they've got a made-up reaction here with made-up chemicals, and they say that it's delta E or it's delta H, the change in energy for it is 150 kilojoules per mole. And the big takeaway from that is that it's a positive number, which means the energy goes up. So we have our starting chemicals, and then some stuff happens, and afterwards we have new chemicals, and the energy has increased by 150 kilojoules per mole from the beginning to the end of the reaction. So that takes care of that first detail. Over here on the left, we have our reactants, the stuff that was there before the reaction. And after the reaction, we have our product, which is compound C. Now, what's all this other stuff they have in there? EAFWD is the forward activation energy. It's energy of activation for the forward reaction. So if you're going forward, meaning this way, how big of an energy hump do you have to get over? And the answer is it's 450 kilojoules high, which means starting from these chemicals, you have to put in not only 150 kilojoules, not just 300, but 450 way up here. That's the amount of energy you have to put in to get this reaction to start. 450 kJ. After that, the energy will drop back down and land here. You remember when we talked about how you have to take your reactants, tear them apart, and then reassemble them to get your products, and each of those steps has a different cost? Here it turns out it's very expensive to dismantle A and B. You pay 450 kilojoules to do that. Then there's a drop. You get, uh, I guess it would be 300 kilojoules of that energy back as these are reassembled. And so overall, once it's over, the cost is only 150. The other 300 you could think of like a deposit that you end up getting back after the reaction completes. So this is what we call the forward activation energy. I tell people it's how high of a hump do you have to get over to get to the other side. Starting from down here, you have to go 450 kilojoules up. After that, the reaction will go by itself. It's like pushing a rock over a hill. If you're coming from this direction, you have to push the rock up 450 feet. Once you do, gravity takes over and you get the rest of the, the way for free. So, that's the forward activation energy. The potential energy is what we're measuring on the vertical axis. So, I've drawn all this without an axis because you can kind of get away with that. But if we label this like a proper graph where it had a y-axis and an x-axis, or horizontal and a vertical axis, what we're measuring along this side is chemical potential energy. This isn't necessarily zero down here, we're just saying that compared to the beginning level, the end level is 150 higher, and this intermediate level is 450 kilojoules higher. And the x-axis is what we call the, ax the reaction axis or the reaction progress. So there aren't any specific units for the reaction axis other than it's before the reaction, during the reaction, after the reaction. So it's kind of like a time axis, but we don't have specific units for time on it. It just uses the general categories of before, during, after. The transition state is up here. You remember, we're taking A and B and dismantling them, so all through this part we are tearing apart A's and B's into their individual pieces. When all that's done, and we have all of our loose pieces ready to be reassembled, that is what we call the transition state. The atoms are in transition then they reassemble into their new forms and we get our product state and we have A plus B and we have C. So is this endothermic or exothermic? It's endothermic because energy goes in. If this was the forward activation energy, what do you suppose this is? 
This is the reverse activation energy. This means if we're over here at C and we're trying to run the reaction backwards, how high of a hump do we have to get over then? It's not 450. We're already up here. We have to get from 150 up to 450. So the reverse activation energy is only 300 kilojoules. Think of this like if you're already 150 feet up and you have to get over a 450 foot hill, how much further must you climb or push a rock? If you push your rock up 300 feet, that gets you to the top here and after that the rest of the ride is free. How would your diagram have been different if the reaction had a two-step mechanism? If there were two steps, then you'd have something like initial state, transition one, transition two, and then your final state. So you can have a reaction, and then a second reaction, and then finally you get to your products. And there can be a bunch of steps in a reaction sometimes, but all it means is you have more, more uh, transition states. This reaction only had one transition state. This one would have transition there, transition there also. That doesn't come up very much. I kind of wasn't expecting that question, to be honest. And the last thing they mention, a little bit off the page. Let me see if I can get to it. No, it's going to be tricky to get up there. They say, a catalyst speeds up this reaction by providing an alternative two-step mechanism. On your diagram, sketch a curve to represent the effect of the catalyst. Well, no matter how the catalyst works, its effect on this curve is it lowers the activation energy. So with a catalyst working, you still have to dismantle A and B, but that happens more easily and then you come back down to your product level. So the thing to know about a catalyst is it doesn't change where you start, it doesn't change where you end up either, it only changes the height of the bump in between. It makes it easier to get from your starting point to your end point. All right, let's see if we can do all that again. Same kind of question. They give us a made-up reaction and they say you really need this to get yourself started. The delta H or the delta E, the energy change, is 56 kilojoules per mole and it's negative. A big detail here is that it's negative, which means you start with a certain amount of energy and you have less afterwards. How much less? 56 less. That's minus 56 kJ per mole. And so the reactants, the chemicals before, are D and E. And the chemicals after are F and G. And they say the activation energy for the reverse reaction is 120 kilojoules. So if you're down here and you want to get up to the original point, this is reverse because we're going right to left, You'd think you'd only need 56 kilojoules. It turns out you need more than that. You need 120 because of the activation energy. Starting from here, you'd have to go up 56 just to get to this level, and then up another, what is it, 64, I believe? Another 64 kilojoules. That gets you to a total of 120 kilojoules up. Then you drop off the other side, and you get to this. So this is like you're at the bottom of a mountain. You want to get to the other side, which is 56 feet higher. 56 feet is not much of a mountain, I know. And they say, but you're going to have to go up 120 feet to get there. This is 120 feet. This bump, 120. After that, you're over the peak, and you go down the other side easily. So that's your reverse activation energy. Uh, potential energy and reaction progress you saw are just the labels we put on our graph. That part's easy. This is your chemical potential energy. And in this direction is 
reaction progress. The transition state is the part in between where we've torn apart these molecules and we're ready to make new ones, or where we've torn apart D and E. So right there is the transition state. And we have our reactants DE and our products FG. So is this reaction endo or exothermic? What do you think? You can tell just from this. If the delta H is negative, it means the chemicals start out with a lot of energy and they dump energy as the reaction goes on. They dump energy out into the surroundings. That means this is exothermic. Determine the forward activation energy for the reaction. So if this reaction is going forward, we have to get over this hump to get the reaction going. How high is that hump? Well, all this is 120 kilojoules. 56 of it is covered here, so how much more is there in the bump? 120 take away 56 is 64, I believe, so the forward activation energy would be 64 kilojoules. 64 is enough to get you to the top of the peak here, and then you'll drop 64 more to there, plus another 56, total of 120, and that gets you to the bottom right where you're supposed to be. So the forward activation energy is 64 kJ. And again, they ask at the bottom, sorry, it's hard for me to scroll down there. A catalyst speeds up this reaction by providing another mechanism on your diagram, sketch a curve to represent the effect of the catalyst. They say a three-step mechanism. I don't care how many steps it is. The effect of the catalyst is going to be the same no matter what. It's going to make the activation energy lower. It's going to make that hump less high. That means it's easier for the reaction to get started.